Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, and a warm welcome to today's book lunch and conference on ASEAN and the reform of investor state dispute settlement, global challenges, and regional options. My name is Céline Lange, and I will be your MC today. We begin immediately with our first panel on investor state dispute settlement, reform and ASEAN, do multilateral solutions address regional needs? So for this first panel, our main speakers will be Professor Jensen Kalamita, who is the head of the Investment Law and Policy Program and a research associate professor at the NUS Center for International Law, as well as Dr. Sharalampos Janakopoulos, who is a um, senior research fellow at the NUS Center for International Law. They are the authors of the book ASEAN and the Reform of Investor State Dispute Settlement, Global Challenges and Regional Options, recently published by Edward Elgar, and which will serve as a starting point for discussion today. Professor Pajasier of the Singapore Management University School of Law will serve as discussant for this panel. So before I hand over the floor to the uh, speakers, I would like to inform you that you can send your questions for the speakers to Professor Sier via the chat box throughout the session. Professor Kalamita, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Celine. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everyone. Um, let me share my slides um, so we can start right into it. Um, Harry and I are going to begin today's event by providing an overview of some of our critical findings and arguments, um, addressing broadly the question of whether multilateral solutions address regional needs in ISDS reform. Um, and I think it's worth noting at the outset that although our focus is on ASEAN and its FTA partners, um, the question about regional solutions is one that can and probably should be asked more generally um, in other regions, um, especially um, Africa and Latin America, um, for reasons that I think will become clear as I go through our presentation. Um, we have five parts. I'll be covering the, the first three, the drivers of ISDS reform, ISDS reform in the UNCITRAL process, ISDS reform, and ASEAN um, will be covered by Harry, uh, multilateral institutional reform from an ASEAN perspective will also be covered by Harry. And then I'll finish up by looking at some ASEAN-focused solutions. Um, again, this is um, these are highlights from, from our book, um, and they're meant really to spark some thinking that's been lacking so far in working group three, namely um, the regional perspective um, for uh, ISDS reform. So if we look at the drivers of ISDS reform, they are, I think, well known to those who follow uh, this area. We can put them under four main heads. Um, outcomes of decisions, namely consistency, coherence, predictability, and the correctness of decisions. Um, questions about the arbitrators themselves, uh, the party appointed character, their independence and partiality, um, processes uh, like double hatting, and the diversity and representativeness of arbitrators. The cost and duration of proceedings, um, the size of awards um, can be uh, quite large, especially for developing states. Um, the legal costs of an arbitration are themselves uh, quite large, averaging approximately 5 million US dollars for a respondent state. Um, the phenomenon of third party funding, which um, almost exclusively benefits claimants in supporting their claims against states, but due to the incentive structures, um, is not typically, um, if ever, available 
to respondent states in defending themselves. And then finally, a more general concern among states about um, a procedural imbalance. Um, after having experienced uh, the system that they've created for the past 20 years, I think it's fair to say that for many states, there is concern about a lack of control over access to ISDS, control over the interpretation of their treaties, and concerns about their capacity to defend themselves um, from ISDS claims um, by well-funded claimants. Uh, to put it in summary, we can look at certain characteristics of the existing system and see how they lead to concerns um, that states um, are feeling and that are driving the current reform process. So we have a system of ad hoc dispute settlement without the possibility of appeal, and this feeds into concerns about inconsistent decisions, incoherency within the system, and unpredictability about particular decisions, um, and the concerns that sometimes tribunals get it wrong and there's nothing that states can do about it. Uh, we have a system in which arbitrators are appointed by the parties themselves and in which some arbitrators will both serve as arbitrator as well as counsel and perhaps even as expert in particular cases. And this leads to concerns about independence, about impartiality, and it leads to concerns about representativeness. Where is the arbitral bar being drawn from? Um, it's North America and Europe. Um, it is not the developing world. It is not Asia. Um, characteristics of the system, a lack of predictability with respect to cost allocations, third-party funding that I've already mentioned, and this again leading to concerns about high costs of investor state arbitration, the length of time that it takes to resolve an investor state dispute, and ultimately concerns about the equality of arms between states and claimants. So those are the drivers for reform. And it is with those drivers in mind that the current process in UNCITRAL Working Group 3 um, has taken, has gone underway. UNCITRAL Working Group 3 was mandated to work on the procedural reform of ISDS. It has no mandate to look at substantive uh, content of investor uh, investment protection treaties. The work of UNCITRAL Working Group 3 began in 2017, um, which seemed like a long time ago at that time, um, but it is expected to complete itself in 2026, which is now only three years away. Um, since 2021, um, perhaps uh, in light of the uh, forthcoming deadline for its work, um, once a trial has increased the number of sessions that it is holding each year, increase the number of formal and informal sessions as well. Um, when one sits in the meetings of UNCITRAL Working Group 3, um, and the Center for International Law is an official observer in Working Group 3, and, and Harry and myself represent the center in those meetings, um, one quickly sees that there is a, a continuum of ISDS reform options um, that are under discussion. Um, and looking at that continuum, we can take it from non-structural to partially structural to fully structural. And different scholars, different observers have used different nomenclatures. But I think for the purposes of our discussion today, these will probably suit. Now, in terms of non-structural reforms, what we're talking about here are states which see the need for incremental improvements to the existing system of ad hoc investor state arbitration. These are countries like the United States, like Japan, to a lesser extent, uh, like the Russian Federation. Um, countries that would like to maintain party-appointed arbitration um, 
ad hoc arbitration, but to make improvements um, to the functioning of that system, whether through the creation of codes of conduct for arbitrators or through mechanisms for the early resolution of uh, claims that lack merit and so forth. Now, moving along the continuum, we come to states which are keen to see some structural changes. These are structural changes that would be, in a sense, a bolt-on to the existing ad hoc investor state arbitration process. And here what we're talking about is the establishment of an appellate mechanism. Um, China and India in particular have voiced uh, support for this approach. And here the idea would be to allow for arbitration to proceed at first instance, um, as it currently does through the party appointed ad hoc system, but then to build into that an appellate mechanism which would allow for uh, the review of questions of law, um, if not also for manifest errors of fact. And then finally, to the far right, we have suggestions for full structural reform. And this would be the replacement of ad hoc investor state arbitration with something that is far more judicial in appearance, um, a multilateral investment court. Um, the chief proponent of this uh, position is the European Union, which has adopted it on a bilateral uh, basis in uh, a number of its investment protection agreements. Uh, Canada is also titularly uh, in support of, um, of the multilateral investment court, although it should be noted that their support for the court has been considerably more muted than the European Union's um, during the debates. But what we would see with the multilateral investment court is a standing court with judges, tenured judges, a first instance court followed by an appellate court, um, and ultimately the replacement of um, anything that might look like what we currently think of as ad hoc investor state arbitration. So with that, let me turn things over to Harry um, to talk about ISDS reform in ASEAN. Harry? Thanks very much, Jensen. Um, now, I think to appreciate the position that ASEAN countries have taken in the uncentral discussions, we first need to take a step back and appreciate the treaty landscape within which ASEAN countries find themselves. ASEAN's investment treaty landscape is rather complex. Um, ASEAN countries have been particularly active in their investment treaty making over time. And the landscape that they have created is multi-layered and varies widely in its content. Now, as, um, as you can see in this graph, the graph shows a new investment treaties signed by ASEAN and the member states. And about 80% of these 387 treaties are currently in force. And there are three levels of ASEAN treaty making to note here. The first level is the intra-ASEAN level, which is the light blue one in the graph, and includes 24 treaties, which is to say ACIA, and 23 BITs concluded among the various ASEAN member states. Already we can see a first type of overlap here. An ASEAN investor is covered by ACIA and may potentially also be covered by a BIT that the investor's home state has concluded bilaterally with another ASEAN member state. For instance, a Singapore investor in Indonesia is in principle covered by ACIA and the 2018 Singapore Indonesia BIT. The second level to note is the extra ASEAN level, which are the small red columns um, in the graph. And this level includes investment agreements concluded by ASEAN as a community with its FTA partners. As of now, there are seven such agreements, six agreements with Australia, New Zealand, China, Hong Kong, India, Japan, and the Republic of Korea, and of course, there's ASEP, RCEP, the seven agreement, which brings together ASEAN and all of the above FTA partners except India and Hong Kong. An important feature to uh, note regarding these ASEAN external agreements is that they, that they are plurilateral, meaning that ASEAN is not a party to them as a separate international legal person. 
And that's because it is the ASEAN member states themselves who retain the full competence with respect to trade and investment matters. Therefore, rather than all ASEAN countries coming in as a single contracting party, they do so as 10 separate contracting parties instead, which then means that every ASEAN country separately and individually owes the same obligations to every other ASEAN member state in the same way that it does to non-ASEAN counterparties in those treaties. Now, because of the plurilateral nature of ASEAN's external agreements, ASEAN member states may be exposed to legal claims that originate from investors whose home state may very well be another ASEAN country, in addition, of course, to the non-ASEAN party. This option for ASEAN investors is moreover on top of the option that they have to seek protection and bring claims under the ACIA, which further expands the scope of potential liability for ASEAN countries and ultimately undermines ACIA's primacy as the legal instrument to regulate intra-ASEAN investment protection. Another complicating factor is that RCEP does not replace, but rather coexists with all the other investment agreements that ASEAN has over time concluded. So to return to our example of a Singapore investor in Indonesia, that investor can also count upon ACIA, the Singapore Indonesia BAT, and any other ASEAN external agreement, presumably including RCEP for protection. Now adding an even further complexity is a third level of ASEAN investment treaty making which is the level of the individual ASEAN countries. And you can see that in the gray um, colors um, in the graph. Here one finds over 350 treaties concluded by individual uh, member states with third countries. And to note about 45 or so of these treaties are concluded with the ASEAN FTA part partners that I mentioned just a minute ago. And so for example, an Australian investor in Singapore may be covered by the Australia-Singapore FTA, ANSFATA, and RCEP, and that's just only on the ASEAN side, because there is also the CPTPP to um, keep um, track of where Australia and Singapore are also parties. Now, in addition to being multi-layered as um, described, ASEAN investment treaty making also varies widely in its content. And what we mean by this is that one sees investment treaties with more sophisticated, more modern, or more reform-oriented provisions coexisting with less sophisticated, less modern or less reform oriented ones. Looking again at the graph, we see that the bulk of the treaties were concluded in the 1990s and to a slightly lesser extent the 2000s. This is of course consistent with the international trend, which shows a similar progression in the conclusion of investment treaties over the years. However, as is very well known, investment treaties concluded in the 1990s and the early 2000s, known as first generation treaties, um, have general characteristics uh, such as um, a more emphasis on investment protection, fewer safeguards for states, and a generally wide and unrestricted access of investors to investor state dispute settlement. In summary, there are multiple overlapping treaty relationships among ASEAN countries, as well as between individual ASEAN countries and the ASEAN FTA partners. Foreign investors may therefore be in a position to treaty shop to pick and choose among all the duplicative treaties, the one that appears to be the more favorable to them. Uh, next slide, please. So with this in mind, um, let us now see what is the position um, of ASEAN in the control debate that Janssen just mentioned. A first observation to make here is that there exists no ASEAN position as such. Although there is um, the ASEAN Coordinating Committee on Investment, which in principle could serve as a facility for member states to share views, one instead sees that ASEAN countries participating in those discussions tend to express their individual views and not those of ASEAN as an organization or as a community. Now, this is not to say that we cannot see some common threads emerging in the positions that are expressed. And key concerns that have been raised consistently by ASEAN countries include the high costs, of arbitral proceedings, which um, Janssen mentioned earlier, and I will not um, elaborate any further here, and also the general absence of dispute prevention mechanisms in the existing system, which in principle, at least, such mechanisms are expected to help reduce time and alleviate costs. A third kind of concern um, one hears from ASEAN countries is the overall underrepresentation of the region in the nationality of the arbitrators most often chosen, which is also linked from the perspective of some ASEAN countries to um, what is perceived to be a general unfamiliarity of arbitrators with uh, circumstances of developing economies. And on this particular point, if we can go to the next slide, please. One can, looking at exit statistics, for example, 
we can see that nationals from ASEAN member states have been appointed in less than 10% of all ICSI cases to date. And if we expand the search to include East Asia more generally, the percentage increases, increases only marginally. But what has to be also noted about these figures is that most of these appointments have actually been institutional appointments made, for example, by the chair of the ICSID Administrative Council in the context of annulment proceedings, and are therefore not appointments made in original proceedings by the disputing parties themselves. And so going back to the uh, general concerns raised by the, by the ASEAN countries uh, in the next, oh, correct slide, thank you. Um, we can also see now that some countries have even gone um, further and have pushed for an expansion of the working group's procedural mandate. This is, for example, the case of Thailand and Indonesia, who have cautioned the working group that procedural reform alone is not sufficient. There is thus an additional implied concern here about correctness and coherence in judicial interpretations. For example, Thailand in particular has expressed favor for the um, development of model clauses for substantive investment protection to be included in any final output negotiated by the working group. So overall, one might say here that the main concerns that ASEAN member states have with respect to investment arbitration um, are not so much about the legitimacy of ad hoc arbitration as such, as is, for example, the case for the European Union, but with what seems to be an unsustainable system in terms of the number of cases that it brings and the resources that it requires to mount an adequate defense. And with an overall sense of um, lost control over the dispute settlement process on the whole. Next slide, please. Now, to our mind, um, this is what explains the um, overall cautious approach that ASEAN countries have uh, taken so far with respect to structural multilateral reform at Uncitral. Although they have made uh, constructive interventions on the development of reform solutions, both structural and non-structural, ASEAN countries have so far not really committed to either side yet. Um, and this is also where we see some divergences in the views um, expressed. For example, again, Thailand is the most vocal um, in its skepticism of an investment court and to some extent, even an appellate mechanism. Whereas more neutral and open-minded towards a court at least is Singapore, Although it is important to note here that neutrality and open-mindedness so far have not translated into outright support for a court either. The remaining countries, um, ASEAN countries, have generally been cautious to not express a clear position yet. They seem open to discussing the possibility of a court and a standing appellate mechanism. However, our overall sense would be that of probably likely reservation towards the prospect of at least an investment court. Next slide, please. No one has to ask, is such a cautious approach towards multilateral institutional solutions justified? In short, the answer we think is probably yes. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, please. Now, to be sure, institutional design in a permanent instrument can address some of the concerns that ASEAN countries have. For instance, a court can include processes on dispute prevention or mediation or, or put time limits. But important concerns that ASEAN countries have may remain unaddressed. And I have three key concerns here to, to briefly uh, mention, one being coherence and correctness. Um, and again, the critical feature here from ASEAN's point of view is the large numbers and variable content of the treaties that we just saw. And one could foresee minimal coherence here if a court or an appellate mechanism adopt a treaty by treaty approach to their interpretations which does not seem very likely, but what is perhaps a bit more likely is that we see higher levels of coherence, but through what one may call a process of forced homogenization of carefully bargained for treaties. Because after all, homogenization is what would be expected of a permanent court or an appellate mechanism. A second kind of concern that would remain probably unaddressed would be representation and familiarity with the needs and circumstances. A lot here depends on the selection and appointment of adjudicators. At the moment, the discussion in the working group on the exact number of adjudicators and the method of their appointment in a, in a, in a permanent institution seems to focus on a fixed bench model. One can think of the ICJ or the ITLOS bench as examples here. And in that scenario, it is unlikely that ASEAN countries would see greater geographical representation than they do in the existing system. And lastly, the third sort of kind of concern has to do with costs 
Um, and that's mainly because, um, you know, as of now, there's there's been relatively few numbers of, of um, investor state dispute settlement cases brought either by ASEAN investors or um, against ASEAN countries. For context, there have been only about 40 or so such cases. Um, although we have noted that there's, a there's been a steady filing of cases every year in the last decade. However, it is with those numbers, it is still an open question whether um, those kinds of numbers would ultimately justify joining a multilateral court or an appellate mechanism and assuming a prevailing, the prevailing overhead costs to maintain them. Therefore, joining in multilateral institutional reform as this is currently being considered um, at Oncitral, we think is probably not an obvious choice for ASEAN countries. And on that note, I would hand it back to Janssen to explore prospects for developing regional solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. <clears throat> yes, and the final uh, part of our presentation, um, I want to present uh, some of the, the ASEAN-focused solutions that uh, we raise in our book and um, have, have raised as well in the working group. Um, and we raise these against the background that, that Harry has just been describing, um, against the expressed concerns of ASEAN member states. And the reform options that we put forward, you know, range from what one might describe as blue sky um, proposals to more practical proposals. Um, but we do so taking note of what um, appears to be a unique moment, a unique opportunity presented by um, RCEP um, in which uh, ASEAN and its RCEP partners um, find itself find themselves in perhaps a a one-off circumstance. Um, so let's talk for a moment about RCEP. Um, RCEP brings together, with the exception of India, um, ASEAN and its FTA partners, and sets out a single set of substantive investment rules. Um, it has not, as of yet, established a mechanism for investor state dispute settlement that is meant for discussion in the future um, and may well um, involve some kind of investor-initiated uh, mechanism for bringing claims. Um, what we see here is an opportunity um, for the RCEP states to construct a system of dispute resolution um, that can align with the views of the member states and with the views of the ASEAN FTA partners um, at UNCITRO um, and take into account what we perceive to be a general skepticism um, of the MIC among those states. Uh, the benefits here, of course, are writing on tabula rasa, the idea that there would be flexible options for design, the possibility of either adopting incremental reforms or structural, partial, or full to address regional needs and to address the kinds of issues that Harry was describing, the representativeness, the question of coherence and consistency, dispute prevention, and so forth. Now, on the, dis on the blue sky end of things, um, we imagine the idea of an ASEAN or an ASEAN plus tribunal. And here, what we would be thinking of is the possibility of a standing tribunal uh, made up of ASEANs or ASEAN and its FTA partners um, with variable scope for jurisdiction. So an ASEAN tribunal might simply have jurisdiction to hear claims being brought under the intra-ASEAN treaties. That is to say the ACIA and the treaties uh, among and between the ASEAN states themselves. Or it might have jurisdiction to hear claims arising under the ASEAN FTAs, including RCEP. Um, or it might even have a broader scope jurisdiction to hear claims arising under intra-ASEAN FTAs, uh, sorry, treaties, um, and all the treaties that the member states have entered into with ASEAN FTA partners. The permutations are considerable. 
um, as is the potential for structure. One can imagine a situation in which ad hoc arbitration is retained as the first instance mechanism for dispute resolution, but a standing appellate mechanism um, is put in place to act as the mechanism for uh, correctness, for coherence, for consistency, but again, a specialized appellate mechanism focusing particularly on this set of treaties, the ASEAN treaties, the ASEAN plus treaties. Um, at the same time, if states were reminded to, of course, a full standing tribunal along the lines of an MIC could also be established um, representing a move away from the ad hoc arbitral approach. But again, focus specifically on the ASEAN treaties and the treaties that ASEAN and its FTA partners have entered into, including um, RCEP, which is, of course, one of the largest free trade agreements in the world. The potential benefits, I've sort of forecast them, consistent and coherent interpretations, arbitrators and adjudicators who would be representative of the parties to the treaties. With an ASEAN tribunal, obviously the judges would be drawn from the ASEAN member states and from their FTA partners. So there would be considerable representation um, of arbitrators or judges uh, from the ASEAN member states. There might be a question about the maintenance cost of establishing different type, different permutations of an ASEAN tribunal. Um, having said that, as Harry has mentioned, the number of cases involving ASEAN member states um, does continue to rise steadily. Um, and in the event that such a tribunal were established involving the FTA partners, um, the costs would be um, among 16 to 17 uh, economies, depending upon how one treats Hong Kong. Um, beyond that, we also consider the idea of establishing an ASEAN, ASEAN solutions within a multilateral institution. So the idea of establishing solutions that address the concerns of ASEAN within a multilateral solution that the working group three might adopt, let's say an MIC or an appellate mechanism. And here, two particular permutations jump out. One is the idea that there might be specialized chambers, which are dedicated to specific treaties, either within the MIC or within an appellate mechanism. And here we could imagine treaties under which one would expect um, considerable amounts of litigation to arise over time, just as one might have thought the NAFTA could have supported its own type of uh, institution for dispute resolution. Here we might have in mind CPTPP, RCEP, or the ASEAN plus agreements taken as a whole. Um, similarly, one could conceive of chambers which are dedicated to treaties by and among particular parties. So chambers that are devoted to treaties um, among and between the ASEAN member states, for example, or the ASEAN member states and their FTA partners. Um, in raising these issues in the meetings um, at Working Group 3 the past fall, um, it seemed quite clear that um, at least within the European Union, the, the central um, demandeur of the multilateral institution, um, these kinds of special chambers um, were certainly something that uh, was within the realm of consideration as far as they were concerned. Now, of course, all of this, ultimately, there are practicalities which we do not, uh, we do not fail to take into account. And let me close here. Um, in the first place, there is the issue of ASEAN political will. As Harry mentioned, Within ASEAN, there's the Coordinating Committee on Investment. The question is whether or not there is will among the ASEAN member states to use ASEAN institutions to help support ASEAN-focused solutions. Then there are the ASEAN FTA partners themselves and their own concerns, 
both with respect to ISDS as, as a general matter, uh, but also with respect to establishing ISDS permanent structures. And finally, as Harry detailed so well, there's the problem of ASEAN's overlapping substantive treaty commitments. So simply establishing an RCEP tribunal would not be enough because of the ASEAN FTAs, because of the ACIA, because of the bilaterals. And this, in a sense, it still poses RCEP as a potentially particular and unique moment for ASEAN and its FTA partners to simplify and streamline the way in which they treat investment protection, both in terms of the treaties which will remain applicable and the operation of MFN clauses within RCEP in particular. Um, this is not something that the parties did during the first negotiation of RCEP, but it certainly strikes me that it is within the realm of possibility for them to do um, in the event that they adopt an ISDS mechanism for the investment chapter in the RCEP agreement going forward. And with that, thank you very much. I'll leave things there. Pasha, I think I can turn it over to you. Um, okay. Uh, okay, thank you very much for inviting me to join uh, this book launch um, uh, webinar. Um, um, it's a great pleasure to review um, this excellent book on ASEAN and the reform of ISDS, written uh, by my colleague, uh, Professor Jensen uh, Kamita and Dr. Harry uh, Chala uh, Lampos, uh, Jenna Kopolos, I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, this book uh, provides a timely and important contribution to current debates on ISDS reform um, and also fill a much needed gap in the literature on international economic law. In particular, the book provides the very first systematic analysis of more than 300 ASEAN economic agreements. And this is a very holistic approach because traditionally, trade and investment lawyers uh, focus on either ASEAN FTA or BIT concluded by individual um, uh, ASEAN states. And this is where we got high profile ISDS cases, for example, in the cases of treasure mining and planning uh, mining, uh, the investor uh, put a claim against Indonesia based on Indonesia's BIT with the UK and Australia. And by examining um, these um, ASEAN agreements, uh, the book also provides a very unique global South perspective on on CITRA Working Group 3 proposals, as well as a regional solution to global problem, such as the establishment of the ASEAN Investment Tribunal that uh, Yang Sen just alluded to. Um, the first question I want to discuss is why uh, we need to pay attention to ASEAN investment treaty making. The concept of ASEAN centrality in regional economic framework has been recognized by all the powers in the region. Um, including um, the United States, the European Union, and Canada. And ASEAN agreements also provide very, a very important normative foundation for new Asian regionalism. The book also talks about an important concept, ASEAN Way. Um, the book defined, uh, defined ASEAN Way as a soft manner of ASEAN cooperation. Through the legalization process uh, under the ASEAN Charter and ASEAN Economic Community, the ASEAN way has transformed to hollow obligations, but different from Western uh, FTAs and ASEAN agreement that follow the legal approach of what I call pragmatic incrementalism. Harry also alluded to the competence issue, which is a key difference between the European Union and ASEAN. Currently, ASEAN is an intergovernmental organization, but ASEAN lacks the full competence for treaty making power. Therefore, uh, in terms of ASEAN agreements, all ASEAN countries are party to the agreement. So the interesting uh, uh, case that Harry talked about, um, for instance, Indonesia can bring a claim against Japan under ASEAN Japan FTA, but uh, Indonesia can also bring a claim against Singapore under the same FTA. And this is quite interesting uh, when I read the book. 
the development of ASEAN agreements are also in line with global trends moving from the era of proliferation to the era of reorientation. That's why uh, we have many recent ASEAN agreements uh, include uh, reform elements. Um, Harry and uh, uh, Jensen mentioned ACIA, uh, ASEAN Comprehensive Investment Agreement, which is the most important um, agreement that govern investment protection and liberalization within the ASEAN economic community. We should know that ACIA actually has no direct effect on domestic law, but it doesn't mean that it's useless. Uh, in fact, ACIA provides a very important model for domestic law reforms in many countries. We should also know that um, at this point, three ASEAN countries have yet to join exit convention, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. And Indonesia has terminated more than, three, uh, more than 30 BITs since 2014. So um, ACIA uh, may be um, the, an idea or the best choice for investors to bring claims against these countries. ACIA's ISDS, uh, ISDS provisions are largely based on the US model BIT, but in ASEAN history, there was, uh, there was, there's only one ISD, uh, ISDS case, Yong Chi Wu versus Myanmar. Uh, this is a dispute arising from a pre akia agreement. In terms of, in terms of a state to state investment uh, disputes, the legal basis in ASEAN is the protocol on enhanced dispute settlement mechanism, EDSM. If you look at EDSM, um, what we can easily understand is quite close to the WTO mechanism that include a panel and a petty body. But again, the problem is none of ASEAN countries have used this mechanism. And in fact, in ASEAN countries, as the DS371 uh, indicate, um, ASEAN countries much prefer to bring intra-ASEAN trade dispute to the WTO. Now let me provide the list of uh, investment agreement in ASEAN plus uh, one FTA. Um, so all, most ASEAN plus one FTA include investment agreement. In 2019, um, uh, ASEAN and Japan also amended the, uh, the FTA and include the ISDS provision. But we should also know that ASEAN Hong Kong investment agreement and RCEP have no ISDS provision. Uh, several um, agreements in the region, um, the ASEAN agreements include what I call reform elements. Uh, for example, in 2019 amendment to the ASEAN Japan FTA, Indonesia and the Philippines require exit arbitration to condition government's consent. Um, 2019, in 2019, Indonesia, Australia, BIT, also met the government's joint interpretation of provision and disputes binding on the tribunal. And as the book I mentioned, the 2019 Singapore uh, Sri Lanka FTA also met uh, the exhaustion of local remedy a prerequisite for access to an arbitral tribunal. So now let's look at RCEP, which uh, Jensen and uh, Harry mentioned several times. RCEP is an ASEAN led process. So this is not a China led process. So, and all parties agree it's an ASEAN led process. And RCEP is the largest FTA by economic scale because RCEP accounts for 30% of global, global GDP. Harry also mentioned that RCEP adopt the so called coexistent, coexistence approach. In other words, intra RCEP agreement will not be terminated. So, RCEP will only promote the de facto consolidation of agreement instead of a de jure consolidation. At the inception of RCEP negotiation, all the parties agreed to have ISDS provisions. In particular, Japan and Korea pushed for uh, more detailed ISDS provisions. However, ASEAN countries, as well as New Zealand, changed their positions so that RCEP party decided not to include ISDS. Uh, but the RCEP provision also say that uh, the parties will start uh, discussing uh, ISDS within two years after RCEP become uh, effective. As many of you know, uh, RCEP uh, entered into force in January 2021. In other words, um, uh, several months from now, RCEP party will start discussing RCEP and, and uh, the ISDS discussion 
should be completed by 2026. So what we are discussing today may be useful for ASEP's future provisions. Jensen and Harry also talk about um, um, European Union's investment protection agreement uh, that, that include uh, provisions on uh, ICS investment core system. Actually, the initial EU Singapore FTA include, included investment protection uh, um, provisions. However, in a case arising from this FTA, the Court of Justice of the European Union decided that provisions on portfolio investment as well as ISDS fall outside the common commercial policy and therefore fall outside the EU's exclusive competence. Therefore, uh, the EU negotiators split the original agreement into two agreements, the FTA and IPA, Investment Protection Agreement. EU-Vietnam FTA followed the same approach. That's why we got EU-Vietnam FTA and EU-Vietnam IPA. And both IPA include provisions on ICS. Um, um, uh, the two investment core systems are quite similar. For example, the uh, appeal tribunal um, has the power to review issue of law as well as uh, issue of fact if the first instance tribunal has manifestly err in the factual determination. But there are also some minor differences between the two uh, investment core systems in terms of the number of judges, also in terms of um, the, the, the appointment uh, process. Under uh, the EU Singapore IPA, uh, both parties can directly appoint uh, judges, whereas under EU Vietnam IPA, the judges will only be appointed by the joint committee. In other words, the parties will have less control over the selection process. In the view of EU, the ICS will lay the foundation for multilateral investment core. However, my view is that um, this proposal has very limited impact in this region because none of Asian countries are considering um, ICS in their non-EU investment agreement. And um, I also like uh, this part of the book, which talk about uh, key countries, different positions on ICS and working group three uh, discussions. Um, um, as the book uh, mentioned, most countries uh, maintain a standby attitude and prefer multiple reform track. And Japan in particular um, is skeptical of uh, the EU proposal for establishing the MIC. Um, China indicates um, its interest in having a permanent equality mechanism. However, the, however, China has not decided its position on the MIC. Uh, finally, let me talk, finally, let me talk about um, the ASEAN Investment, Investment Tribunal. And I think this is a very uh, innovative um, idea. And the book uh, talks about four different models um, with, different uh, with uh, different jurisdictional scope. Um, the first model is based on 24 intra-ASEAN investment agreement. The second model is based on five um, ASEAN FTA. And the third model um, based on 50 um, investment agreement. And the fourth model is a plenary model uh, covering all of the agreement. It took me a while to understand all of the four models uh, as an work. Um, of course, and I would like to ask a question about um, this uh, proposal. Um, I'm wondering if any ASEAN or ASEAN countries have um, um, indicated their interest in having um, such tribunal, and if, if there are any um, um, jurisdictional scope they prefer. But of course, um, there are some practical challenges. And um, the first uh, challenge is what uh, Jens Jensen has already mentioned, the so-called ASEAN way mentality. Because ASEAN countries are reluctant to bring investment, investment claim against other ASEAN countries. So to overcome the mentality, I think it's important to not to have not to limit the scope of jurisdiction. So it will be great to involve more uh, ASEAN FTA partners. Another practical issue is sectarian support. And I believe that it will be more feasible to use existing mechanism. For example, um, EU IPAs, under the two EU IPAs, the investment core system will be uh, supported by the exit secretariat. The EDSM that I mentioned is supported by the ASEAN secretariat. 
And the good thing about RCEP is that the RCEP Joint Committee was established a RCEP Secretariat. So I think it's a golden opportunity. Uh, we should also know that India is not part of RCEP. But the good news is that Hong Kong may join the RCEP. So overall, I think the book provides very insightful information about exit reform from the ASEAN perspective. Let me congratulate uh, Janssen and Harry uh, on this excellent research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pasha. Um, <clears throat> Harry, do you want to take on uh, some of Pasha's questions or should I take a, a first crack at the easy ones and leave you with the hard ones? Um, you can take a first crack. I can uh, try to follow up later. All righty. Um, no, I, I I take note of of Pasha's comment that um, you know what we've seen so far, of course, from Vietnam and and Singapore um, has been a decided lack of interest in pursuing um, an investment court model in their non EU treaties, um, and um, I, I guess I don't find that particularly surprising in the sense that even if these states were inclined to to embrace a, a judicial model, um, I think they might rather wait for a multilateral um, structure to, to be uh, debated and, and assembled. With the EU, I think it's an all or nothing deal. Um, you either accept the multi, the investment court structure that they're proposing, or you don't get I, you don't get an investment protection chapter with ISDS. Um, for them, I, I see it as a uh, as a deal breaker um, due to the internal politics uh, of the European Union and what they think they need to um, what they think they need to bring home in order to get these these deals uh, ratified which is, of course, still an open question um, for all of them. Um, with respect to whether or not there is interest um, within ASEAN member states for something like um, an ASEAN investment tribunal, um, it's fair to say that um, as, a, as a public formal matter, no, there's been no, no statement in, in this respect, but that as a more informal matter, there is interest in exploring all kinds of options which would address regional concerns. Um, and so um, in a sense, our book is is an, uh, an effort to um, to air some of these options, to air some of these possibilities. Um, with the hope that they will stimulate discussion and thought amongst uh, scholars, but amongst ASEAN policymakers as well. Um, and then finally, with respect to the various scopes, I guess you know I, I would agree with you that the idea of a purely intra-ASEAN tribunal um, might not be quite as enticing given the the ASEAN way and the the general lack of claims by ASEAN investors versus ASEAN member states, um, but that perhaps by expanding to include the FTA partners, um, this would, I think, create a um, a more likely scenario, at least in terms of of cases being brought and a need for um, consistency and coherence across agreements. Um, but again, as as you say, as, as as I said, you know the the coexistence of multi layers of treaties um, providing different uh, standards of protection, whether they be bilateral, they be plurilateral, or they be RCEP, um, that's an additional hurdle that um, I think member states would need to deal with. Um, in in a in a very firm way in order to make these kinds of tribunal or regional solutions work harry thanks Jansen. um i i, I only just want to follow up echo what you said and just follow up just slightly wanting to challenge the the um asian way um argument in the sense that 
while I can see how the ASEAN way can be an impediment in um, ceding jurisdiction or, um, to um, um, an international institution um, to hear interstate disputes, for example, I'm not sure that applies exactly to investor state disputes because ultimately it's a private entity that initiates the dispute in that case. So it's not exactly an interstate dispute. So in that sense, I think there is, uh, there is potential to ASEAN countries thinking of different uh, approaches to, to um, consolidating their, uh, their treaty portfolios um, and trying to limit their potential exposure to um, investor state claims. Thank you. Um, Pasha, I don't know if, if if you had any other questions or if there were any in the um, in the chat. Um, I've got a note from our MC Celine um, asking whether we might, uh, if we are at our at the conclusion, we might take a five minute break, um, allowing our other uh, panelists to convene, and then we'll come back with our our second panel. Um, which will um, take a look at the UNSA trial reform process um, from uh, from state capitals uh, among RCEP uh, countries. That's great. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to learning from other colleagues. Welcome back, everyone. We hope you had a good, although very short break. We'll start with our second panel now, which is entitled the Ancestral ISDS reform process at five years. What has been accomplished and where are we heading? Views from RCEP countries. So we are very privileged to have with us today um, representatives from RCEP states who have first-hand experience um, of the discussions that are ongoing at uh, Working Group 3, Ancestral Working Group 3. Uh, so we'll hear in particular about Ms. Rihanna Benjamin, Director at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Australia, Professor Shotaro Hamamoto of Kyoto University, who is a member of the Japanese delegation to Working Group 3, Dr. Krajak Tirataya Kinant, Consular at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand, Ms. Yonshin Um, Senior Deputy Director at the Ministry of Justice of the Republic of Korea, and Ms. Tisho Kinfu, Deputy Director General at the Ministry of Planning and Investment of Vietnam. Dr. Taylor St. John of the Plurik Court Center at the University of Oslo and the University of St. Andrews will be the moderator for this session. And as before for the previous panel, please direct your questions to our moderator via the um, uh, chat box throughout the session. So Dr. St. John, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Celine, um, and, and hello and welcome back to everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, as Celine said, um, I'm Taylor and, and I'm delighted to be here today to not only celebrate Janssen and Harry's terrific book, um, but also to discuss ISDS reform negotiations at UNCITRAL, what's been accomplished so far and, and where we might uh, be headed. As you heard from Celine, we have a wonderful panel um, today, all of whom represent their countries in the UNCITRAL Working Group. And I think what's interesting is that some are veterans who've been there since 2017. Uh, some have joined later. So we have on the panel a nice mix of experiences and views and reform priorities. Um, you, they've already been introduced to you, so I, I won't uh, reintroduce them to you. Um, but I, I wanted to, to note that I've been asked to moderate since, along with Anthea Roberts of the Australian National University, um, I have also been attending Ancestral Working Group 3, like Janssen and Harry, um, just quietly observing from the back. Um, so I've, I've been there since 2017 and plan to attend, uh, hopefully like most of our panel, until 2026, when this process is, of course, at least scheduled um, to end. I just wanted to, to note one thing, that instead of referring to our very distinguished panelists uh, as the distinguished delegate of Japan or as Professor Hamamoto, um, I'm going to use everyone's first name to try to cultivate a sense that maybe we're all in a sort of a shared side room, right, at, at UNCITRAL, um, trying to work out some sort of common RCEP position or, or asking why we can't do that. 
Uh, another thing I, I just wanted to add is that everyone on the panel today is speaking in their personal capacity. So nothing that is said is an official government position. Nothing should be attributed as such. These are just personal reflections on the process. Um, so with that understanding, um, we'll start today with some questions that I've prepared for the panelists, but at the end, there will definitely be 20 or 30 minutes for questions from the audience. And, and I see that we have with us today many experts, also many other UNSA child participants. So please do feel free to write questions in the chat as we go along, and then I will come back to them at the end and we'll try to get as, as many of those integrated as we can. Now, I would like to start the discussion by taking inspiration from, I think, what Janssen called blue sky thinking in that last session. And to me, sometimes it seems like external observers uh, to this UNSATRAL process um, see it as a kind of referendum on the idea of a multilateral investment court, right? So in, in this framing, um, the, the key question is, is a multilateral investment court going to emerge? If yes, then UNSATRAL has been a success. And if no, then it's failed, right? And that's kind of a caricature. Um, but but I think we we hear echoes of that, and and to me that misses so much of what's actually interesting about Ancestral, um, because to me what I find interesting is the way that the process has served as a, a type of reform brainstorming, right? That we see some blue sky thinking, um, including from states on this panel. Uh, in the form of submissions, in the form of suggestions in the negotiations, um, right? We hear proposals for a wide variety of reforms to be made collectively. So I want to, to start by kind of possibly bringing in some of these other reform ideas. And so I want to ask each of our panelists, if you, and again, in your personal capacities, not necessarily speaking for your governments, uh, could choose one reform and guarantee that that reform would emerge from this UNSATRAL process, uh, what would it be and, and why would it be that reform? So I think I'd like to start with you, um, Karajaka, if, if that's okay. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me on the panel and it's my privilege and honor to be among expert, experts in this field. Um, just not to waste your time too much, I'll, Okay, I was speaking in my personal capacity, but I think it's, um, it's the same position that Thailand has been um, opposing in the RC Trial Working Group 3 process. That um, for me, if one thing would come out, would be the um, advisory center for international investment law, um, because um, for developing countries, ISDS cases, um, the most important thing for us is that we have to spend taxpayers' money to defend um, government measures. Um, and oftentimes these measures have, um, you know, um, public policy objective uh, in mind. And uh, if we have access to something like the advisory center, then we can reduce the costs and uh, that, that would be great. And I, I think um, we, we hope that member states would see the benefits of this advisory center and support Thailand and also, you know, um, make it come true. Thank you. Great. Um, Shin Um, let's, let's turn to you. What would your reform be? Thank you, Professor Shin-Chun. Um, hello, my name is Young Shin. I'm from the Ministry of Justice of the Republic of Korea. As Professor Shin-Chun mentioned, uh, I am not speaking on behalf of the Korean government tonight, so it's, it's based on my personal capacity and reflection uh, from my uh, experience with the working group. So uh, in responding to um, Taylor's question on uh, my personal um, expectation on the outcomes, I am quite positive. So um, let me uh, let me just summarize my, my response based on my um, experience with the latest uh, working group session in September. I believe the code of conduct and use of mediation and uh, dispute prevention text will be concluded quite uh, in, in the near future, because uh, while participating in the UNSATRAL working group meeting for two weeks, I felt the um, the enthusiasm within the meeting room to have a to to reach a consensus, and I uh, have at least one or two um, reform options concluded and bring it to the commission in, in early days, and. Um, 
as my earlier uh, panelists just mentioned, I believe that also uh, the working group has a general consensus over the issue on advisory center and also on procedural rules reform, which is considered less uh, contentious uh, compared to other structural reform options. So uh, I may be too optimistic, but I look forward to having as many reform options concluded uh, as possible for during the past three to four years within the working group. Thank you. Thank you very much. And optimism is um, something I think we all need at this point. Um, Shitaro, let's uh, let's go to you next. Yes, El, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, well, I generally agree with the equality on Yunshin. Um, I think the two, if I'm allowed to um, pick up two items, the code of conduct and the advisory center, the, uh, there's, it seems to me that there's a general consensus at least on the concerning the overall framework of the uh, code of conduct, although further de debates and discussions will be needed, particularly in view of the recent decisions rendered by the PCA Secretary General concerning double hunting and for you know, you know, conflicts of interest. But anyway, and there is a clearly there is clear consensus. Uh, same the same applies to the advisory center. Thank you. Great, uh, Rihanna. Let's go to you next. Thank you, Taylor, and uh, thanks for having me tonight. I uh, just uh, wanted to congratulate Harry and Jansen on this um, excellent book. I haven't got through it all, but I'm looking forward to engaging with it. And it, tonight's session has already inspired um, me to think of some more groupings or some informal meetings we can have in the UNSA trial context in light of RCEP parties and ASEAN uh, and Asia Pacific parties. So hopefully there's some, some cooperation and work we can do in that space moving forward. Um, I also hope that we can, uh, if I have one reform, it would uh, be the code of conduct. Um, but everyone else has said that, so I'm moving on to my second one. Um, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about the code of conduct uh, later tonight, but I hope that, you know, at the very least, that is something that, you know, hopefully we will be progressing in the next couple of sessions and we'll make some great progress that we can show to the UNSA Trial Commission and also um, all those watching uh, these negotiations on how we can come up with tangible outcomes. But on, on in that line of um, thinking, um, if I could pick one reform, it would be an, an updated set of procedural safeguards that could be easily adopted by all parties or all parties I'd like to, particularly to upgrade existing agreements. Um, you know, from our most recent session, there was some good momentum behind these. There has been some great work in ICSID and in some of most some plurilateral uh, modern practice, particularly in things like the TPP, um, the USMCA and some of the, the more recent EU agreements that we can really build on. Um, you know, I think having a set of key procedural safeguards that parties can adopt would be great uh, for people upgrading agreements, developing countries, negotiating new ones, and really just setting a best practice for, um, for ways to ensure uh, both the state's right to regulate is balanced with other interests. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jana. Uh, Quinn, over to you. Uh, thank you. Well, first of all, I would like to express our sincere thank for the organizer to, for inviting me uh, to this important event. Uh, with regards to the question, which I will answer on my personal capacity, uh, I think if I could choose one reform, and the, the key aspect here is guarantee that the reform would emerge from the ANSITRAN process, I think it would be uh, reform in the um, specific issues of the ISDS procedure, more, in, um, more specifically, that is the issue on counterclaims, because this issue will touch on the nature of investment claim. Uh, it should be two-way, not uh, one-way street like the current system, because in the current system, it's only the investor who have the right to bring a case to ISDS, and it's only the investor have the choice of forum. But if we uh, are able to do some reform in the counterclaim, which allow the um, um, disputing uh, state uh, to have a canal to address their own concern um, to 
help somehow uh, um, uh, counter the claim by the investor. It would be uh, something interesting and uh, more balanced. Um, and I think the reason why I choose this uh, issue because the, the key aspect of the question is to guarantee that the reform will emerge from the uh, ACITRAN process, because I think that in practice, this um, issue is very difficult to achieve um, uh, the um, uh, resolution in negotiation. Um, and uh, more, um, another aspect is that uh, this issue is so unregulated and uh, not addressed very frequently in international treaties. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just want to pick up on something that, that Quim, you, you said right at the end of your remarks there, that um, having a multilateral process is really a unique opportunity, right, to, to discuss things like counterclaims or possibly get something done on counterclaims that's very difficult for governments to achieve individually in, in individual treaties or in a more piecemeal um, approach. And, and I think um, it's something that struck me, but but also a lot of people observing this process uh, is that the working group is unusual in many ways, right? Before we uh, turned on the microphone or turned on the cameras for, for everyone in the audience, um, we were discussing how a lot of the governments on the panel, but also other governments, it's people from the Ministry of Justice, the kind of litigators who are meeting together in the room, not the negotiators. And that makes this a very different process from normal negotiating treaty negotiating processes. Um, so I'd like to ask you all kind of a question about this unusual process, how you see it and how you've experienced it. And I'd like to turn to Shitaro and Quinn first, since my recollection is that you two have been there since the beginning, since 2017. Um, so I'd like to start with you, Shitaro, and, and ask, how do you think the process has evolved since 2017? Um, what, if anything, do you think has changed in those, um, has it been five, well, five what, years? <laughs> yes, what impresses me is the speed or well, lack of speed of the discussions. It gets slower and slower because uh, the evident politi political importance of the issue attracts more and more states. You know, um, if one, each of those 60 delegations speaks for one minute, it, it takes all, already one hour. And in fact, there are more and more than 60 delegations and everybody speaks more than one minute. And uh, therefore, mechanically speaking, the more important, the more politically important the subject is, and the slower the process gets. Is it, that's inevitable in the multilateral setting. It's quite normal. It's kind of unfortunate, but it's inevitable. And another aspect uh, which is quite interesting for me is the active participation of African states in this process, in particular in working group three. African states were not quite engaged in discussions when working group two were drafting the transparency rules, but this time in working group three, they, they, um, they frequently intervene in discussions and apparently they're quite well informed. I think this is a welcome development. And I think these two elements, the speed or lack of speech, well, it's proportionate to the importance uh, of the issue and the active participation of African states is, I think it's quite important. Yeah, great. Uh, Quinn, I'll ask you the same question. So how has it evolved and, and what, if anything, do you think has changed since 2017? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that since uh, 2017, uh, the scope of the discussion has not been uh, clearly identified. And during that time, people are trying to take the picture of the current state of place, uh, what is the, the problem of the current situation and where we want to improve. But now the uh, the situation, I think, is much clearer and the scope of work uh, clearly identify the SBX procedure uh, and some of the, um, the other reform that are of uh, interest to uh, developing countries. Uh, such as the in like um, like not very structural reform, but very important uh, like damages, counterclaims, um, on uh, third party funding, um, and uh, security for costs, etc. So I think uh, in terms of the the substance, uh, it's more diversity um, diversity and not just focus on the multilateral investment costs. 
uh, and I think that that is some some kind of good things uh, developed from the process. However, I understand that the more issues, uh, the discussion, uh, the um, the slower and the more di more difficult uh, the the outcome to be achieved. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the right damages and third party funding these things are now definitely they seem to be on the working group's agenda um, and i'm not sure that was anticipated at the beginning um, and it has all sorts of consequences um i'd like to turn to the other three panelists now who i i think entered the process at at various points um i'd like to turn i think shinam uh you entered just before the pandemic or possibly during the pandemic um so Maybe I'll go to you first. What struck you uh, about Ancestral when you joined for the first time? Uh, how does it compare to other venues that, that you've been active in related to ISDS? Um, I joined the government during the pandemic in 2020, and I believe it was the uh, it was like in October 2020. It was my first um, Ancestral meeting. Although like there were like numbers of informal meetings, but I, I had no idea what was actually going on. But the first working session was in the, by the end of 2020. Um, I come from private practice, and I used to practice international arbitration for eight years in private firms. So uh, my first uh, uh, impression about the working group was that everyone was very polite to each other so like everyone's very careful listening to each other like uh, and everyone has um, has the opportunity to uh, fully express their ideas however long that is and that was possible especially it was during the pandemic and it was the first online meeting so uh, everyone was just it was really slow so I was really concerned about the speed but um uh, since we returned to the in-person meetings, um, I believe that the speed issue has been resolved and uh, because we've been discussing various ideas through uh, informal meetings, I, I believe the uh, the various options has been um, organized a bit. So like, I, I think that would uh, enable us to uh, move forward a bit more quickly than, than the previous uh, meetings, uh, especially during the pandemic. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to note in this regard was that the, uh, the way how the working group reaches consensus. Uh, when we talk about consensus, we would uh, we we easily think of uh, we think of unanimity, but the consensus in the in the context of the working group is not a unanimity. But um, it it it. Oh, uh, instead, we look for uh, a wide, um, what a widely prevailing majority, I would say, so that like uh, we look for uh, we look for an absence of formal objection, and uh, that would trigger a request for a vote or something. So, um, and and that the consensus um, nature uh, enables the working group to consider all possible available options, and that's the reason why we were able to consider additional options for instance third party funding. Funding. And as we witnessed from the uh, the forty third session, we were able to expand our scope of discussion onto the issue of damages and sort of stuff. So I think those are the uh, unique characteristics uh, that we have uh, in the working group. Yeah, great. And I think this this soft consensus, if I uh, make any predictions, I think it will become more and more important as the process. Uh, gets towards some sort of conclusion, I think that will that will be more on our agenda. Um, uh, Jacker, let's let's turn to you next. Thank you. I joined the process in 2021, so during the pandemic. So um, I have have limited experience with the process, um, unlike uh, Quinn and uh, Professor Shotaro. Um, but what struck me is that um, the the use of the the, the technology the, the zoom meetings i think that allows participation from various government agencies uh, from member states and i think that that helps a lot in the sense that um normally i think in the past when you have to go to the meeting in vienna or in new york in person um with limited budget you you cannot have a big uh, delegation and most of the kind of positions have to be prepared uh, from the internal consultation process. Um, but because the, the substan substance in the working group three is like you uh, previous uh, panelists say, that is expanding and is, is quite open. Um, you know, you, you, you cannot really prepare positions um, 
prior to the meeting. And because of the involvement or the, the more participation by uh, other government agencies through Zoom calls or um, hybrid meetings, that helps the, the kind of internal coordination between agencies uh, to get uh, positions to the, the lead agency uh, faster, I think, than normal. But otherwise, Thailand would be, okay, um, let me come back next time in the next round to give uh, our country's positions. That, that, so that I think the technology um, and, you know, the silver lining of the COVID-19 pandemic is that we maybe uh, have access to new technology and also a new way of uh, discussion and communication. So that, that would be my take so far. And um, I would hope that the hybrid format would continue, I mean, to a limited extent in the sense that um, if you want to speak, you have to the delegation uh, in, uh, in person at the venue, but you would allow access from uh, other agencies to, 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 to attend, even though just to follow the discussion and then you, you, know, you, you would assume that internal consultation can happen more effectively uh, through this format. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks so much. That's something that has really struck me as a sort of unintended consequence. When the negotiations were moved online, I don't think any of us were thinking, ah, this will trigger a change in interagency coordination within governments, right? That wasn't what we saw coming. Um, but I think it is possibly having having these effects within many governments. Uh, Rihanna, over to you. Thank you. Um, just firstly, I wanted to reflect on some of your comments, Jacka, about uh, the hybrid model. And I also support the continuation of it, either through just being able to watch remotely or even for people to be able to participate. I think it's a real issue when it comes to, you know, fairness of attendance and the ability for everyone to be able to participate, uh, particularly post-COVID travel is more expensive than it used to be. So the more that we can ensure the negotiations are inclusive, the better. Um, reflecting on my time in the working group, I joined um, earlier this year um, with my with the you know, recent meetings in my first in-person meetings. And um, prior to this, my kind of uh, uh, negotiation experience has been in the bilateral and plurilateral a trade agreement space, trade and investment agreement space. So, you know, multilateral, big multilateral negotiations are always quite different to that. A couple of things that struck me. Firstly, there are a lot of lawyers in the room. <laughs> um, that, you know, that is not always the case in multilateral negotiations or even, you know, trade agreements. And on one hand, it's really great because you have a lot of expertise. You have a lot of experience litigating ISDS cases and having that real practical or understanding of how it affects the state but at the same time and you know we're, I think we're all a bit guilty of this lawyers do sometimes get a bit bogged down into the details and some of the nuances of words which you know when we're trying to come to agreement on broad concepts it isn't maybe not always the most pragmatic approach to things, um, but just something we should keep in mind moving forward. Um, you know, the other thing that really struck me was the involvement on non-parties to UNCTRAL and also um, the broader investment arbitration community, uh, be it representative of investments, universities, or those interested in the space. Um, I think this is really positive for a number of reasons. It's always great to hear our differing views on issues and remind ourselves, I guess, why we're there and who are the people involved. Um, I think it's also great because, because there's so many additional bodies involved, the negotiations are very open. So we can have discussions like this. We can have books written about the multilateral reform process. And it re in my view, it really keeps the momentum going and encourages the working group to reach outcomes so that we really have something to show. Um, 
So I think it's really, you know, it is unique, but it is also good. I think academics would also like it because they don't have to use leaked texts or, you know, rumours about what's happening with the ISDS provisions in, you know, an agreement. Um, so, yeah, they were, my, they were my main reflections. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. I think academics love this process and we love its transparency. Um, I see both Janssen and... Uh, uh, Charlie Lampo's smiling there. Um, so I'd, I'd like to turn actually to their book as a, as a point of departure now, because I think it's it, it's what makes today's discussion of Ancetral distinctive, right? It's it's bringing in the regional perspective. And, and if we look from a regional sp perspective, how does that shape what we see happening in ISDS reform? Does it shape it at all? Um, so as we heard in, in the first session, um, their, their wonderful book really invites us to think about a role for regional thinking in ISDS reform, where it might differ from, where it might contribute to the global debates that we have at Unsatral. And I think, at least in my um, listening to Unsatral so far, regional trade agreements are definitely mentioned as precedents, right? So we hear um, the active African negotiators bringing up the African Continental Free Trade Agreement as a model. We often hear North Americans mentioning the US MCA or spelling it differently, depending on where they're from, right? We hear some um, Asian delegations uh, citing CPTPP, I think is the one we hear most. I don't think we hear RCEP so much. Um, so my question, since I think uh, all of you are, are from RCEP states, is how do you assess the, the potential of RCEP or the potential of other agreements, those we haven't heard so much be used in the room so far as, as focal points? Um, will those agreements be used in the future? And I think you could answer that specifically about the trade agreements, or you could take this as a more general question. How do you see the potential for un-Asian perspective on ISDS reform or kind of more coordination uh, along maybe particular regional groupings um, from Asia in these reform talks. Uh, so I think let's, actually, let's turn back to you, uh, Rihanna. I'm, I'm keen to hear your take on this. Let's start with you. I was going to wait to the end and um, <laughs> see oh. if some of um, <laughs> some of our colleagues could share their points first on this, if that's okay. Of Thank course. you. Let's do that. Um, Shin, um, may, I, may I call on you first? <laughs> well, I was also waiting for others to make comments on, but uh, I'll, I'll be brave uh, because I, I'll, I can be brave because, um, as I briefly mentioned, I come from private practice and I have really a little experience with regard to treaty negotiation, nearly none. And I, I am with the government uh, to deal with the actual disputes. So, uh, why, uh, where, uh, instead of uh, referring to a specific regional uh, treaty treaty agreement, I, I would just um, uh, share my reflection on on the um, on the um, on the perspective of Asian countries within the working group. Um, unlike the African countries, it seems to me that the Asian countries are uh, have uh, different sorts of experience and perspective uh, towards the investor state or investor state dispute settlement. I think it's because um, individual countries have different, you know, experiences. Uh, only only a number of countries have experienced uh, actual disputes like the Republic of Korea, and uh, or, or uh, some of the countries are actively participating in regional uh, multilateral investment agreement, whereas others are not. So uh, they have different. Uh, so the Asian countries have different sets of experience and, and perspective towards um, investor state disputes. Uh, settlement. But um, I do find that all, most uh, Asian countries who are actively participating in the working group, they do have the, uh, the focus on practical uh, issues on, on ICS. So uh, although they, they're, the focus may be a bit different uh, depending on their individual experiences or focus, um, we the Asian countries are focusing on um, like practical or um, Practical issues that they experience from the real world experience. So I think uh, if we combine sort of um, different sets of uh, experiences and um, 
um, concerns or um, particular uh, focuses, I think that would create a valuable uh, momentum within the Asian countries, or we could also put it, put it into the working group's discussion to provide a meaningful um, momentum to move forward. Oh, that was it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, is anyone keen to go next? Yeah, Jacka, please. Okay, thank you. I'll be brave also. <laughs> um, okay, um, I, I think I'm, I'm speaking from my experience, uh, from my involvement with um, FTA negotiations, investment chapter negotiations within the ASEAN framework, and maybe Queen can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think, first of all, I want to, to, to put it out there that the nature of IIAs um, is that you know, we, we tend to keep the old agreements, right? For example, Thailand, we, we don't terminate our older IIAs, mostly bilateral investment treaties. Even though we have the newer one um, in the form of FTA and investment chapters therein, okay? And these new, newer agreements have modern, more modern provisions. So in my personal view, we should try, government should try to consolidate um, their IAAs basically. If you have newer IAAs, uh, you, you, you should try to terminate the old ones, especially if the old ones are in the form of bilateral investment treaties. Because I think for FTAs, for example, Thailand with Japan, we have bilateral, we have uh, the ASEAN Japan CEP, uh, we have the RCEP, right? And we don't terminate any of them because each of the FTA has its own merits for certain sectors and the texts are negotiated, negotiated texts. So you, you never know whether specific provisions might be beneficial for certain sectors. So you don't, you don't terminate them. Um, but for bilateral investment treaties, at least for in Thailand's case, is that they only covers um, investment protection. They don't have um, liberalization parts, meaning the nuances are not there. So in my personal view, and again, I will try to argue um, with my government that we should terminate or consolidate um, the, the IAAs that we have. So that's the first point I want to make. Um, come to my second point is that RCEP is probably the newest IAA that we have, at least for Thailand and for many countries in ASEAN. And apart from that, it doesn't have the ISDS provision yet. As, as mentioned earlier, that is in the work program. Assuming that it happens, um, assuming that ASEP countries manage to agree on ISDS provisions, then I think there is a, an opportunity to discuss whether uh, ASEP member countries can, to a certain extent, consolidate at least the investment protection elements in overlapping FTAs, I think. But I think it would be difficult to, to go beyond that because like I said earlier, um, there are negotiated texts and there are nuances when it's come to liberalization. So I think it's very difficult to, to just say, okay, let's terminate the bilateral one and use RCEP, okay? So I, I think that my second point. And the last point I want to make is that whether there should be a, uh, concerted efforts from um, this region on ISDS reform. Um, I think for most ASEAN countries, uh, maybe apart from Singapore and maybe Vietnam, because you were part of the CPTPP, um, we are quite cautious of ISDS. So uh, I, th I think most countries will want to wait and see how the discussions at the multilateral level would develop and whether um, policy space or the right to regulate are well protected uh, 
um, at least from a procedural perspective from SDS reform, um, that they are comfortable enough to, to really get involved or adopt or actually intervene or propose something that would be meaningful for them. But I, I, I suspect that at this point, lots, most of Southeast Asian countries are a bit cautious. Thank you. Thank you, those are excellent points. Uh, yes, let's turn to you next, Quinn. Uh, thank you, Tylo, and thank you, Krajak. Uh, I think I t tend to agree with Krajak on the tendency of the country uh, in terms of political uh, to keep um, the existing agreement, because if we want to terminate the old agreement, there must be uh, the question uh, arise will be what is the wrong with the current uh, treaties. However, I think in terms of um, technical aspect, we, we see the clear need to terminate some of the agreement because some of the agreement signed in 1990s are not updated anymore and is not balanced, not set for both investor and the government. And also the legal risk for the government and investor when there are multiple agreement um, regulating one single relationship between, um, let's say, Korean investor and Vietnamese uh, government. Uh, that would be not beneficial for everybody. Uh, so in terms of the whether asset or uh, any potential for ASEAN pers perspective on SDS reform, I think that uh, as Jack, uh, correctly mentioned, even though the asset does not have an SDS provision yet uh, in the future, I think still have uh, great potential to be um, to, to develop some kind of perspective or um, precedent uh, in terms of SDS, uh, because uh, from our experience in the negotiating ASEAN agreements, we see that uh, there are some common features of the ISDS mechanism in uh, ASEAN agreement, such as limitation to post-establishment, the application of fault in the road principle, the reference to domestic law in governing law, something like that. And I think for in uh, possible future new agreement, uh, we are also, um, uh, open to discuss possibility to address new issue that uh, is being discussed in ANSITRAN, such as third party funding, security for cost damage, etc. Because I think that uh, I agree with Craig that uh, we Asian are kind of um, real, um, very um, um, prudent in terms of ISDS. However, well, we think that because we are prudent and um, because um, uh, what we learn uh, from the experience, we learn from uh, the dispute we participate, we, we see um, more, I, I think uh, we will cultivate stronger um, motivation to reform SDS because the reform of SDS does not, uh, in general, provide new, um, new uh, routes for suing the government, uh, con in contrary, it provides some kind of balance and uh, safety valve to protect the, the interests of both parties and provide some certainty in the ISDS process. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I, I like what I'm hearing from both of you is a, a sort of learning in both directions, right? That, that maybe ASEAN states or, or others um, are, are also hearing the discussions about, say, third-party funding, whether that's a disclosure or, or partial ban or whatever it may be that looks possible, um, and bring that into future agreements that are regional. But then also, here we've worked the solution out regionally, and this we can send back to the global. Um, so kind of it, it goes in, in all directions or could go in all directions. Um, Shitaro, let's, let's hear from you next. Yes. Well, personally, I'm not quite sure if there's something there's something such as you know Asian perspective or Asian views concerning the ISDS reform. For example, um, people who talk says that the Asians generally value consensus and do not want to settle dispute with conflictual or adversarial methods and that mediation would be best uh, best method dispute settlement method for from such a perspective. Well this may be true or may not be true uh, as far as the uh, disputes between private persons are concerned. Well that's a matter to be explored by the experts of sociology of law. Uh, 
Uh, but we are now talking about disputes involving states. You know, if you, as as a state, accept the mediation, you have to think about the possibility that you are kindly invited by the mediator at the end of the process to pay a certain amount of money to the investor claim and to settle the dispute, for example. Well, would it be possible uh, for the government to pay such amount of money, whether as a compensation or ex gracia, without any legal obligation whatsoever? I mean, you have to explain to first the Minister of Finance and the Parliament, and at the end of the day to the people, you know, that the state had a better to pay this amount of money to settle the dispute to the investor, although there is no legal obligation whatsoever. This is extremely difficult, if not absolutely impossible, in any place of the world, Asia or elsewhere. So uh, this is you know, nothing more than one, one example that indicates, at least to my mind, that there's no such thing as an Asian perspective regarding the SDS. Great. Uh, and I know I've, I've heard that from others as well outside this discussion, um, just a, a refutation of that premise. So I think it's a good one for us all. We can um, keep it in mind. And I'll, I'll ask after we turn to Rihanna if anyone um, wants to take up that, that premise. Uh, but Rihanna, do you have any uh, thoughts on the um, potential for agreements to serve as focal points or, or on the wider question of kind of Asian cooperation in, in Ansichal? Uh, thanks, Taylor. And um, I'll, I'll just be brief, but I do think um, the UNSA trial, the work that we're doing there will will be used and would likely set, you know, some guiding principles or reform ideas for any upgrade to future um, or existing regional agreements. Um, you know, the UNSA trial project is coming up with some really um, innovative and useful reform options. And I think because of the membership of it and how it does overlap with this region that we would be using those um, those options to to modernize or update our agreements in the region. Thank you. Great. Um, I think I will actually in the next question um, I want to ask specifically about another of what I, I think Janssen and Harry referred to as a blue sky proposal. Um, which is for a standing ASEAN investment tribunal, right? And you saw in the presentation, it could have jurisdiction in uh, different permutations of, of jurisdiction. Um, could be limited to the comprehensive investment agreement, um, could be much wider, right? All investment treaties that ASEAN member states are, are party to, um, various permutations, right? So I I want to ask, um, and I think I'll start with, with Quinn and, and Krijeka, um, what you think about an ASEAN investment tribunal or possibly an ASEAN chamber within a wider multilateral investment tribunal? Um, does that seem feasible to you? Um, what obstacles do you see uh, to, to its emergence? And, and one of the obstacles could be, well, we don't think there's an ASEAN position on, on these issues. Um, would either of you like to start with that uh, difficult question? Yeah, Quinn, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, with regards to the question about a potential uh, ASEAN investment tribunal, uh, I think that uh, similar to the um, benefits of the multilateral investment court that has been uh, discuss in the uh, Ancitra Working Group, we can see some possible benefits such as consistency, correctness of the award and the maybe more willingness of the parties to implement and enforce the award. Uh, however, uh, this mechanism might create um, concerns such as the cost for maintenance uh, and uh, and the representativeness of the countries in the adjudicator board. However, I think that uh, the, the risk in that area is much lower than in the uh, global uh, investment court. Uh, and I think the, there is another concern which might not be that strong in the um, multilateral investment court, that is the workload for the tribunal. 
Uh, because if we think about the jurisdiction of the ASEAN Investment Tribunal, it is only limited to the FTAs uh, and why the BIT is still available. And uh, at the current stage, it's the investor who have the choice of treaty and choice the forum, a chance that they might only choose the BIT. And if the jurisdiction only limited to the ASEAN FDIs and BITs and the ASEAN investor, uh, I think that uh, even though um, the, the no, people might not, might, might have different views, but I think that statistically the ASEAN investor are culturally not very litigated because when we see the, the statistic, not so many ASEAN investors sue the ASEAN governments. So I think the number of cases might not enough to justify the existence of such tribunal. But if we include the ASEAN FTA and BITs uh, between ASEAN countries and partners, we may run into the problem of how to revise the relevant treaties to accommodate the assistance of such um, tribunal. That's uh, what I have in mind uh, currently. Yeah. Great, great. Uh, Krajaka, over, over to you. Thank you. Um, and I, I tend to agree with Quinn also. But first of all, I think we can draw experience from the um, enhanced protocol, ASEAN enhanced protocol on dispute settlement. But that's state to state, obviously, and it's only capture disputes arising from ASEAN economic agreements. Uh, the latest one, I think it was mentioned earlier um, in the previous panel. Uh, the, the latest one is 2019, I think. And they, they try to fix uh, flaws from the previous version. Um, but it hasn't, have never been used by any ASEAN member states. Um, and like Quinn said, I, I think the culture in this region, um, governments, and also maybe to a certain extent, private, the private sector, we, we don't like litigation, I think. So um, you might have a dispute, but there will be kind of behind the scene or uh, kind of closed door meetings to consultation to, to solve the dispute. Uh, so even though I, I recognize that because this is the, in the context of ISDS, and you know the private sector or private firms might have more incentive to 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 use the dispute settlement mechanism uh, as compared to the ASEAN uh, EDSM. But I I still have some reservation to the demand side, if you like, um, and that would come to my second point: is that um, the cost of maintaining this mechanism. Um, uh, is it a, just a, a roster, just a list, or you have to pay people on the list, you know? And this is one of the reasons why um, Thailand is very cautious of the MIC or even a bilateral investment mechanism uh, within um, an FTA with the EU um, that Singapore and Vietnam have, that how are we gonna pay for the costs? and whether it's justified. And you cannot just pay you know, a little money to these um, uh, arbitrators. You know, they, they have to be well compensated, otherwise they, they wouldn't be willing to, to work for you. Uh, so, so that would be my initial response to your question. Um, so I, I, I can see the potential benefits, but I think we have to, to at least ascertain some demand and uh, and it's maybe chicken and egg thing, you know. If you don't, you, you are not sure about the demand, are you willing to establish the mechanism? Is that a political will? Uh, is that enough political will and then to back up with the money, with the budget? I, I am not sure. Um, so that, that's for me for now, thank you. Yeah, yeah, these are excellent questions and, and I think reasons for, for caution. Uh, I'd like to turn to the other three now for their thoughts. And Rihanna, was that your hand I saw excitedly going up? If so, please take the floor. So, <laughs> I'm I'm redeeming myself from the previous question, and uh, thought I would I would jump in now. Um, thank you for all those comments. And you know, 
ultimately, if this is an ASEAN uh, investment court or tribunal, I would always defer to ASEAN countries' views. But a few, um, a few things that I was considering is, as had been mentioned, you know, there are some, you know, uh, benefits, including consistency of interpretation of ASEAN FTAs. Um, it could be a good opportunity for representation and diversity of panelists if we're you know identifying uh panelists from the region um and i also think you know uh, creating a court could properly understand uh asean countries and also uh the interests and concerns of developing countries which could be useful in um determining cases uh like some of the issues that have been flagged on the I guess some of the concerns around a potential uh, investment court in this region, there is the fact that there is not as many cases as there are in other sections and the costs involved. Um, how it would work for ASEAN plus one FTAs um, and, you know, I guess jurisdictional and competence issues surrounding those. And I think if we're creating a, a Asian region or an ASEAN region court, what this could mean for a fragmentation of decision making. You know, some of the people supporting the multilateral investment court in working group three, you know, it's about having consistency across ISDS as a whole. And if you start up a separate court, you know, is there a risk that uh, they will start a juris jurisprudence off in, into a different path? And that would be something that needs to be considered. Um, it has also been mentioned by others in, in some of the previous questions, but and my experience as well in negotiating in the region is uh, some ASEAN countries take a pretty conservative approach to dispute settlement. And, um, you know, one of the sensitivities that arises with this idea of a multilateral court is uh, who appoints the arbitrators and losing some of that state control of the appointment of arbitrators. So, you know, careful consideration would need to be given to what the structure for the appointment of arbitrators would be and um, how much involvement states on a, I guess, an ad hoc or a case by case basis would have. Thank you. Great. Uh, Shotaro or, or Shin, um, would you like to come in on this point? Um, well, basically I have nothing to add to what Rihanna has just said. Well, uh, it's, it's of course up to the ASEAN member states, but I find the proposal quite interesting, particularly in terms of the diversity of the adjudicators. An ASEAN tribunal or chamber will necessarily have ASEAN uh, nationalities who are currently underrepresented in the investment of church tribunals. So in that, uh, from that perspective, it's maybe interesting attempt. To... Wonderful. Shinam? Um, I echo all, of the, all the comments from the, my previous panelists. And um, uh, well, I, I do understand that there will be certain benefits from creating such um, such mechanism within the Asian uh, ASEAN countries, but however, I would like to raise uh, two or three concerns uh, um, uh, in light of the discussions that we are currently um, performing within the working group. Oh, when we talk of the uh, multilateral standing mechanism, we 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 generally say that the objective and purpose of um, preparing such a mechanism is to enhance consistency and predictability of um, the decisions. However, as uh, as as most of the panelists have mentioned, uh, we do not have a uh, lucid idea on how much the caseload would be, and we all agree that the caseload would be very uh, case. We do, we are not going to have a lot of cases from the very beginning, and in that regard, I do uh, I, I I have concern whether that would uh, move that could all move forward to enhancing consistency and predictability in the ISDS jurisprudence, and also it may create another further. Uh, fragmentation within the ISDS system. Uh, another uh, concern that I, I have is uh, would echo uh, Professor Hamamoto's previous um, comment regarding the uh, adjudicators. Uh, we all understand that the um, standard for the qualification of adjudicators in ISDS system should be very high compared to compared to other other areas. Uh, and we also understand that the representation is also very important. And um, the reason there would be a benefit in this regard to have uh, 
Asian countries represented in the uh, uh, panel of um, adjudicators. And the, uh, however, um, I do concern that uh, focusing on a, a specific um, qualification or issue may uh, lead uh, lead to uh, a decrease in other qualifications. So that would create a concern on the quality or um, quality of the adjudicators that would serve for the tribunal. And because the case load would be, would be not that big, uh, I, I concern whether we would be able to have the uh, full-time full -time adjudicators serving for the for that mechanism so uh if we but i i do that i i, I but i believe that there would be uh, ideas to deal with those concerns and if we are to really um really develop this kind of a uh, mechanism um it would be important to that we provide we uh, develop a flexible um um devices to deal with those concerns thank you wonderful so just before i i move on to our our final the final fun two questions I want to ask you. I want to ask if Quinn and, and Jack are having heard these other comments would like to add anything or, or respond to anything on this question. I would like to comment a little bit on the, um, the issue of uh, fragmentation. Uh, I think that um, the creation of um, the ASEAN Tribunal a possible ASEAN mechanism uh, is not contrary to the, the, the whole purpose of ISDS reform because um, I think if we want to do something, we can do it uh, either uh, as, a, as a whole or gradually. And if, uh, if it's the, the, the spirit of the everybody is trying to address the issue of you know, consistency, predictability, and it cannot be done in the global aspect. Uh, I think uh, starting from a regional uh, um, area, I mean, from a regional perspective is not a bad idea. So I don't think that is contrary to, to the whole, uh, I, I don't think that it would create more fragmentation because Anyway, if you we don't have the the tribunal, the fragmentation exists uh, still exists with the different ad hoc tribunal. Thank you. Okay, um, I have only one point to make. I think um, if if we were to have this blue sky approach to to be successful, I would think that we might also need to consolidate the. IIAs um, within the region, like I mentioned previously. So if, it's a big if, if there is a political will to, let's say, use RCEP as the main investment protection uh, mechanism uh, within um, the member states, right? Uh, then an, an, uh, a body that composes of representative from member states to look at this big agreement that is the RCEP that would replace uh, other IAAs between the parties would make sense. And that would uh, pave the way to have consistency in the arbitral awards. Because otherwise, I think if you have several agreements, even though you have the same kind of panel, you still subject to treaty interpretation, different provisions. And I, 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 I doubt that we will have consistency um, in, that, in that circumstance. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I, I thought we would come to that at some point in the panel, but it, it seems this ancestral process um, is meant there's a relationship between process and substance, right? Procedural and substantive. And we get so far from it, but we come back to these questions um, about how far can we go in one without the other. Um, but I, I want to turn us away from these, I think, very real and very difficult concerns that, that you've all just raised and these thorny questions of how this could come about um, to give you a, a, a completely imaginary hypothetical just to hear, hear your responses on it. Um, so... Let's imagine, and this will be a stretch of the imagination, uh, as Jacker just said, a big if, but let's imagine that a new physical institution does emerge by 2026 
from Ansatral, right? And maybe let's say it handles investor state arbitrations one day, it handles state state arbitrations the next. There's a, a standing court of first instance on the first floor of the building. There's an appellate mechanism on the second floor of the building. There are rooms that can be booked for mediation on the third floor. The fourth floor is for interpretive statements, right? Um, and let's say uh, China is a member of the appellate mechanism and of first instance arbitration. The EU is a member of the appellate mechanism with the first instance court, and the US didn't sign anything formally, but then they were looking to set up a claims commission regarding, let's say, property um, in Ukraine, and they thought, ah, actually, it's nice to have a standing mechanism or a standing institution. Let's, let's put this claims commission there, right? So we've kind of seen the US slowly migrate some cases there. In this hypothetical, which I don't have to even say this out loud, is completely a figment of my imagination. Um, does it matter if this physical institution is based in Asia, right? Let's say it's um, at the Ancestral Region Regional Center in Incheon. Um, it could be many other places, right, in, in Asia. Does having a geographical headquarters in Asia shape the way that Asian states see it? Does it become a, a, an idea or a, an issue area with more Asian ownership? Um, in this, I emphasize, <laughs> completely imaginary hypothetical. Um, so let's start with um, Shin Um. um yes, um, I, I do believe the physical presence of such institution would be important. And if we are able to have that institution present in Asian, Asian one of the Asian countries, it would be very helpful um yeah and um well we I, I think there are various uh factors that we have to consider before like uh, making such determination but like based on uh professor st john's um uh, imaginary <laughs> scenario um we would have to first decide whether it would be a um single single institution uh, or having a multiple like single institution having like regional branches like if 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 we have the regional branch i think with that there will be one definitely in, the, in 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 one of the asian countries but if we are going to have the single center then it would definitely mean a lot to the asian countries if we are able to um have that center uh, in in Korea, uh, not in Korea, I'm sorry, I've been representing Korea for, for quite a long time, so, but in one of the Asian countries. And um, uh, when we were when we were uh, providing country comments as to on the issue of its advisory center, the Republic of Korea has uh, mentioned that uh, having the center located in in a uh, in, in uh, the um, RCAP office in Incheon would be an uh, would be an option because it, we already have the facility and then we could um, develop the uh, the institution from a very small you know office to a large one. So, uh, but there are various factors to consider. But I think it would mean a lot even if we were like uh, regardless of whether it would be a central institution or the re the regional representative office. But uh, it would be important and uh, meaningful for uh, for the Asian countries to have one of those offices in in Asian region. Thank you. Thank you. And and don't worry, I used Korea in my wild hypothetical, so that's why you I think used it in in yours. Um, but that was what what we actually wrote in our country comments. So I was very impressed. Thank you. <laughs> Good, um, Quinn. What what do you think? Would it matter? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think in the case where. Uh, a multilateral investment court is established. The physical um, office of the, the court is even more important uh, than in the current situation, like exit of PCA, because um, um, if the multilateral court operate in the same way uh, as the exit, uh, enforcement mechanism. Uh, the the there would be no legal seat of arbitration. The legal seat of arbitration is not matter anymore. Therefore, uh, in this case, the, the physical uh, address of the office uh, can contribute a lot to the re the reduction of travel expense for the parties in the region and. Um, it can increase the knowledge of the reason for adjudicator. Uh, and I think in ISDS case, it's very important. Uh, it can also contribute 
more, create more opportunities for legal community in the region when they work or practice or do the, the, the interns in the, uh, the office. And it will promote experience sharing and education and training in ISDS uh, in general for, for the region. And, and I think that currently Vietnam has just signed a, um, like a host country agreement with the PCI and we, we, we feel uh, very clearly the benefits of uh, such um, re regional office. Thank you. Great. Uh, Krajaka, over to you. Uh, okay, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I just, I'll just keep this answer short. I think I agree with Quinda um, and, and, and uh, Shin Um as well, that if we have uh, an office uh, here in the region that would help, especially with the costs um, and that would encourage uh, countries to, oh, Asian countries to use it more. Um, also, I, I think I can see the benefit of um, having a segment or a training um, training training course at the advisory center that I, I imagine that would would you know establish alongside the the MIC in Asia uh, that would operate like I think the advisory center for um, a WTO law I think yeah ACWL that that offers some. Uh, capacity building or training course or segment to, to various members. And I think that, like Quinn said, would provide opportunity for the legal communities in this region um, to, to, to strengthen their capacity. Thank you. Yep, great. Um, Shitaro, let's, let's come to you next. Yes, um, well, from the strictly legal point of view, for the answer is evidently no. It doesn't matter where the siege or headquarters is situated, as been said. But from a political point of view, the answer is quite the opposite. Of course, it, it's quite important as a matter of symbol, for example. It, it's better to have a physical institution in Asia to show the, to the Asian people that the investment law or SDS is something directly relevant to Asia. Well, although I'm not quite sure if it's better to have a uh, such an institution in Japan or in New Zealand for geographical reasons, but anyway, I think it's good to have uh, something like that in New Zealand. Thank you. Great, wonderful. Uh, Rihanna? Thank you. I don't have much to add, um, but I, I do think some positives of having the center in Asia would be one, the time zones, you know, as we can even tell from this session here, it is a very, um, it is an area that uh, is accessible by a lot of the world, um, both time zones and also the ability to travel to there from different parts. Um, it is conveniently close to Australia. <laughs> um, but I also um, think, you know, it's important to balance the location of it in relation to developed and developing countries so that for example, the institution doesn't seem just like a Eurocentric centric one. Um, and we've reflected on that, the fact that there isn't actually as many ISDS cases in this region as there are in others. And given that maybe it could actually be seen as a bit more of a neutral territory, um, you know, for cases to be heard compared to potentially other places. Um, Finally, you know, reflecting on some other comments from tonight about hybrid and online, the thing we have discovered is, you know, these can be, these hearings can be heard in person or physically or a combination of both and um, having them in this region could potentially facilitate that. Thank you. Great, wonderful. Um, I see that we, we have about 15 minutes left in our session. Um, and we have a few good questions that have been sent to me. Um, so if you are in the audience and have a question, for, um, please do type it into the chat um, and I will make sure that we, we get it to the panelists. Um, in the meantime, I want to ask one last question that um, was sent to me by chat, but is also uh, uh, close to something that I, I think we're all interested in, which is if you do look forward to 2026, um, and not making up my wild hypothetical, but looking forward from where we are today, oops, um, 
what do you expect realistically to emerge from the UNSATAR Working Group 3 process? And how useful do you expect that outcome or those range of potential outcomes to be for the challenges that your governments face um, related to ISDS? And I know that's sort of the, what, 6.6 .6 billion US dollar question, um, if, if you're Pakistan. Uh, so who would like to, to start? Any, any keen volunteers? No? Then um, I might, uh, Quinn, I don't think I've turned to you first yet, so I might put you on the spot if, if that's okay. Sorry, did you mention, did you say me? Oh, I said Quinn, um, but feel free if, if you'd like to go. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, very sure about my question, my, my answer, but I think uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether I'm being optimistic or pessimistic, but I, um, uh, from a technical point of view, I would hope that there would be some technical outcome from the discussion or some non-structural reform, such as uh, some of the issue we are concerning, uh, we are interested in like um, security for cost, third party funding. Um, I think the, the the code of conduct is also one thing that I think code of conduct is the, the easiest uh, thing to be resolved and other issues uh, that uh, hopefully possible like uh, um, damages, counter claims with regards to the structural reform, like the multilateral investment court. Uh, I'm, I'm not very sure about that, but I definitely hope that uh, after we send, spend so much money in sending delegations to like one or two weeks meeting in Vienna and New York uh, twice every year, we should receive something from that. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I think the investment from governments in terms of time um, has has created expectations, um, certainly. Uh, Kratzaka, would you like to jump in now? <laughs> sure, uh, thank you. Um, okay, at the end of the process, um, my best case scenario, or what I what what I hope for 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 the outcomes would be, uh, we managed to to agree on the technical side of things. For example, the code of conduct, third party funding, um, and, uh, and other provisions, but not the MIC. Um, and I hope that we would agree that we, we can set up the advisory center for international investment law um, without the linkage with the MIC. Uh, and the last, hope for me would be uh, we would have the momentum to start thinking about the substantive side of uh, ISDS provisions or, or IAAs, let's say. Um, I, I, I think we are dealing with the easy part, the easier part, let's say, um, of the reform. And even though it, it is very beneficial, but it will not solve the problems that we are we have been talking about today or in the w um, the wg3 uh, and i i think the way forward after 2026 would be you know having some kind of uh, discussions on certain provisions for example uh fair equitable treatment expropriation i, I know that I'm, I'm opening kind of kind of worms here but I, I think that's the way forward. I mean, otherwise you cannot solve the problems um, in a kind of holistic uh, way. Um, so I, I hope that will be my best case scenario. Thank you. Thanks. And just before we move on to others, I just want to abuse my position as chair to ask one follow-up question. So for those discussions, uh, post-2026 on things like fair and equitable treatment, those other more difficult, possibly, uh, substantive discussions. Would you see those discussions happening in UNSATRAL, possibly? Or would, is UNSATRAL one possible place um, 
are you open to other options? Kind of where do you see those happening best? I think if, if we have a successful process um, at the end of 2026, I think that would set up well for the LC trial as a forum to, to take on this. But I see the benefits of collaboration with other uh, specialized institutions like ICSID um, or OECD. Um, I, I, I think the next phase of the reform, IIA reform would, would require you know, all hands on deck and um, inclusive participation from countries and international organizations alike, um, because it will be a big, big ask, I think, to, to, to manage to put that off and maybe gonna take another 10 years or something after 2026, and maybe the involvement of the ILC as well, um, if they could uh, come in and, you know, part of that job is to codification of uh, international law anyway. So um, I think that would, that would be a possibility for uh, the ILC's uh, role to play here. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be a, a really interesting actor to bring in. Um, getting back to the, the original questions on what you expect to emerge in 2026 and the extent to which that may answer uh, concerns your governments have. Um, Shin Om, let's, let's turn to you next. Yes, um, I think it's better that I go first <laughs> than Professor Omamoto or Brianna, uh, because they would have uh, more thoughtful views. Uh, my, my expectation, uh, a very, um, very uh, like, a two, well, by 2026, I would hope that uh, the reform options that were included in my optimistic basket would be con concluded. For instance, code of conduct, uh, mediation, dispute prevention, uh, advisory center, and procedural rules reform, like uh, most of the technical aspects of reform options would be concluded. One concern that I have is that uh, without the implementation of those um, reform options, uh, we we had our first uh, official discussion on multilateral instrument in the 43rd session in, uh, in September, and there were very divergent views, although we only had one day of meeting, like there were very divergent views and um, various comments. So I think that um, in addition to completing the, the individual uh, option, uh, reform options, it's important that the working group uh, prepare and discuss the uh, the implementation options in order to have the practicality of, um, of the reform options that is to be concluded by 2026. What would happen after 2026? Um, I think that would be, would be possibly two options. Um, First, as uh, my previous panelist has mentioned, I do see that uh, it's, it will be really difficult for the working group to conclude the discussions on the uh, structural reform options, most notably the multilateral investment court. So if the working group feels dire to uh, continue the discussion on the structural reform options, I, be, I think that the working group may decide to uh, proceed and continue the discussion. So because, um, we have uh, devoted a, a certain amount of time and efforts in, you know, uh, elaborating and organizing the basis of the discussion on the, those structural reform options, or as. Um, Dr. mentioned, uh, we may uh, may focus on the substantive issues, but uh, we'll have to see what would happen in 2026. Uh, my my almost um, almost. Um, like dream or um, hope would be to con con finalize the code of conduct by, by next year so that the working group could present uh, at least its first um, first outcome or product and present it to the world that all oh, the working group is actually working. Thank you. Great. Yeah, it'd be a good marker of, of momentum. Um, let's turn to you, Professor Hamamoto. Shitaro, what are your thoughts? Yes, um, well, uh, what we have to avoid is, of course, a deadlock forward negotiation and eternal extension of deadlines. Uh, we can all agree on that. And I think the most appropriate and the most realistic at the same time, um, the result would be the what is called the incremental approach in which the working group three will, will produce the sets of rules or guidelines with respect to each item one by one, for example, first in the code of conduct, and then let's say the third party funding and the counterclaims and what, what not. 
and states will be able to adopt such set each set of rules if they find it appropriate to their interests and needs. And as for the post-2026, I'm not quite sure if um, the ancestral or any other multilateral forum is appropriate for the uh, discussion on the substantive rules. Because for example, just take an example of the FET. Um, Japan concludes, Japan has concluded, I don't know how many investment treaties, um, but it, you know, it's investment treaties. For example, the uh, Japanese investment treaties concluded with state A contains a uh, very simple FET. And Japan has you know, another type of fair and equitable treatment clause with state B. And it also has a, a third type of FET clause with the state C. And this is all the result of negotiation and this choice is made deliberately. So, you know, the, if just take, just, just take an example of Japan, we have a, a wide variety of FET clauses. It's not because the negotiators are stupid, but because, you know, the, this is a political decision. Therefore, I'm not quite sure if, you know, it, to, it's appropriate to have a, a single multilateral forum to discuss substantive clauses. Thank you. Great. And that um, that reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from Ancestral, which which actually came from Australia, um, uh, when the Australian representative said, uh, "We're not painting on a blank canvas. We're painting on a canvas that is already filled with paint um, in, in the form of previous commitments, some of which are very different, or or are blue, but very different shades of, of blue." Um, with that. Uh, Sully avant-garde intro. It's getting late in the evening for many of us. Um, Rihanna, I'll, I'll turn to you. Thank you. I can't take credit for that um, phrase. It would have been one of my predecessors, but I will have to think of something as creative for a future negotiation round. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, I agree with a lot of the comments that were being raised here. By 2026, um, you know, being realistic, I don't think we will have resolved all reform options, but it would be good if we had some clear um, reform options agreed as outlined by um, my colleague from South Korea. Um, and I think also it'd be good if we had a clear understanding of how these could be implemented or enforced, and also a clear understanding of if there are still structural reforms on the table a clear understanding of what they will look like and an understanding of where they're going so that um, if they have not been resolved by that time, we can, you know, have concerted efforts focusing in on those um, rather than having, I guess, blue sky discussions about where things may end up. Thank you. Perfect. And just in our, we have one last minute remaining and I, I wanted to bring up um, a reform that my sense has been there's, um, an amount of warmth towards this reform in the room, um, but we haven't talked about it yet today. And that is just a permanent appellate mechanism um, being established, um, kind of regardless of what happens with the first instance court, regardless of what happens of other, with other reforms. Would anyone like to offer thoughts on, um, I guess, the, the likelihood of an appellate mechanism or difficulties or concerns uh, about such a body emerging? Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief um, because uh, is uh, I think we are running out of time. So first of all, I think um, if we have the appellate kind of appell appellate mechanism, um, we have to answer whether with three thousand IAs can they bring any consistency to the outcome of an arbitral process? If we are sure that we can do that, then I'm all for it. But if you are not sure, uh, I, I think the discussion needs to continue. Thank you. Wonderful. Any other thoughts? Well, just one thing. Uh, Coach Coach, you have just said that is it possible for, for a preferred mechanism to bring a consistency? My question is, is it a good idea to bring a consistency with the 3,000 treaties? You know, so I'm quite skeptical about that. Great. And Quinn, did I see you? Have your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Taylor. Uh, I think that the appellate mechanism um, 
is more important in terms of correctness because from as a kind of repeated player in uh, in ISDS yes, uh, from the government, I think it's more important uh, that the decision uh, of the tribunal is correct and uh, fair and consistent with what is the intention of the party when negotiating the treaty than the consistency as uh, uh, Professor Hamamoto has mentioned. Thank you. Wonderful. Any last thoughts? Otherwise, I realize we're a few minutes over and I know that it's it's into the evening for many of you. Um, so all that's left for me to say is first to all of our panelists, thank you so much for what I thought were really thought provoking answers. Um, you've surprised me and I, I have more to read and, and think about now. Um, I'd also like to congratulate um, Janssen and Harry for their wonderful book and also for the prompt. Um, yeah, <laughs> can I clap um, for the, the, the kind of um, intellectual jumping off point for this discussion, right, of, of what role can can regional thinking play in global debates um, and, and vice versa. Um, and thank you to NUS Singapore um, for, for organizing the event and, and hosting us and bringing us all together. Um, so thank you all very much. And now I will turn back over to Celine, I believe. Thank you so much, Taylor, and thank you for chairing this panel so well. Um, thank you to all our speakers and panelists today for their comments, presentations, insights, and to our participants for attending the session. Uh, we hope you found it informative and interesting. Please note that a recording of today's session will be available on CL website soon, and that uh, the book that was launched today, and congratulations again to the to the authors, uh, will be uh, is available actually already for purchase uh, on Edward Elgar's publishing website, uh, as well as on Amazon. So, um, from all of us here at uh, CIL, uh, we wish you a good remainder of your day, and uh, we hope to see you soon at other CIL events. Thank you so much, and goodbye. Thank you.